Uh, Dee Dee Gutton Plan served as the lead nation election correspondent through the 2015-16 election season. A, uh, unenviable task, I think, but thank you so much for doing that fantastic reporting. Traveling across the country throughout the primary season and attending the major speeches and rallies of all the candidates. His first book, The Holocaust on Trial, was highly praised in The New Yorker as well as other publications. And his biography of I.F. Stone, American Radical, won the Sperber Prize for biography. But he's here tonight to discuss this new book with hopefully a, a, a somewhat positive take on some of our future politics, The Next Republic, The Rise of a New Radical Majority. Please join me in welcoming Didi Guttenblatt. Thank you, and thank you all for coming out. Um, I guess I should begin by telling you my own election night story, which is that I, um, I spent election night in upstate New York. The night before the election, I was at a Trump rally in Manchester, New Hampshire. And then I went to upstate New York because um, Zephyr Teachout, who's the subject of one of the chapters in my book, was running for Congress. And I said to my editor, and I'm, I'm confessing this so you understand that I'm a reporter, not a prophet. I make no claims to being able to see the future. I said to her, um, I'm gonna go be with Zephyr because if she wins, that'll be a really interesting story, even though I didn't think she was likely to win, but I thought she might win. I said, and besides, if she loses, there'll be plenty of time to come down to Times Square and watch Trump's concession speech. So it didn't, it didn't turn out exactly as I'd expected. Um, but, uh, the Next Republic has a subtitle, The Rise of a New Radical Majority. And the important words in that subtitle are rise, as opposed to decline, <laughs> new, as opposed to same old, majority, as opposed to sect, and above all, radical. So uh, let me begin by explaining a bit about the book by reading to you from the introduction. And the introduction is called In Search of the Lost Republic. And it will hopefully also explain why I keep using this word republic, which you hear bandied around a lot, but which in the context of this book has a specific meaning. As he was leaving Independence Hall one morning in 1789, Benjamin Franklin was accosted by a Philadelphia woman wanting to know what kind of government he and his fellow delegates had devised. The deliberations of the Constitutional Convention had been held in secret and all kinds of wild rumors were beginning to circulate. Well, doctor, what have we got? Elizabeth Powell is said to have demanded. A republic or a monarchy? Franklin's reply was brisk. A republic, madam, if you can keep it. From its earliest days, the survival of our republic has always been in doubt. Can we keep it? For many of us, that uncertainty became painfully salient on the morning of November 9th, 2016. I'd spent the previous 15 months covering the election for the nation, beginning with the Republican National Committee summer meeting in Cleveland, where after the first Republican debate, and you'll remember that was the debate where they had the grown-ups table and the kids table, um, I'd written that Donald Trump's unpredictability, his manifest inability to respect the norms of party, civility, or any institution or structure not bearing the Trump name, preferably in gilded letters, makes him the campaign equivalent of crack cocaine. Though I didn't think any of the other occupants of the Republican clown car could beat Trump, I assumed the Republican National Committee would find some other way to stop him. Well, we know how that turned out. Over the months that followed, I attended Trump rallies in half a dozen states, from Florida to New Hampshire. But while I'd been watching Donald Trump out of the corner of my eye, fascinated by the reinvention of a man whose first brush with bankruptcy I'd covered as a writer at the Village Voice and New York Newsday in the 1980s. My main focus was elsewhere. Assuming that the campaign would be boring, I told my editors I wanted to concentrate not on the candidates, but on the voters, volunteers, activists, and movements that make up the political ground on which elections are fought. I was wrong about the campaign, which turned out to be anything but boring. But I was right in thinking that there was a deeper story to be found far from the lights and the cameras. Walt Whitman heard America singing. I heard a country screaming at itself, at shadows, at enemies domestic and foreign. Lock her up, build the wall. But I also heard something else, 
a quieter sound underneath all the shouting, a collective gasp of recognition and amazement. I'd heard it most clearly in a high school gym back in February 2016, on the night Bernie Sanders won the New Hampshire primary. Sanders himself was elated, reminding his supporters that when he'd begun, we had no campaign organization and no money. Only it wasn't Sanders I was listening to. It was the audience, a mix of old radicals and young activists, tie-dyed grandmothers from California and the Carolinas celebrating with thick-waisted older men in union windbreakers and college students in blue Feel the Burn t-shirts. Could Bernie really go all the way? That magical night, with Nevada and Michigan still ahead of us, anything seemed possible. But what I remember even more vividly than that moment of wild hope was the sensation of looking across the packed gym and being astonished at how many of us there were and realizing that, everyone, realizing that everyone else was just as surprised. For decades, the media had been relentlessly reminding us just how far outside the mainstream we were. In a country where Ronald Reagan and Lee Atwater made liberal a badge of dishonor, a label to be shunned, where did that leave those of us further left? Since the fall of the Berlin Wall, nobody bothered calling us communists anymore. But to call yourself a socialist, as Sanders had done, was an invitation to derision. We'd watched in dismay as the bankers deregulated by Bill Clinton crashed the economy, only to be bailed out by Barack Obama, while millions of ordinary Americans lost their homes and their savings. We'd seen George W. Bush's National Security Agency spy on millions of Americans, and Barack Obama's Justice Department try to lock up the whistleblowers. We'd witnessed the war on terror give way to the war against Iraq and heard the cries to bomb Dam Damascus and Tehran. So when Bernie stood up and said, enough is enough, we were ready to stand with him. But we weren't prepared for what happened next. Grown used to our own marginality, we weren't prepared to discover that there were literally millions of us in every state and every region of the country. It must be said that Bernie wasn't prepared either. The campaign that began somewhere between a quixotic gesture and a protest movement came close enough to winning the nomination to scare the hell out of the Democratic Party establishment, which hadn't exactly kept its thumbs off the scale during the primaries. Socialism, it seems, is no longer toxic. Of course, you know that here in Seattle. Indeed, polls show that among younger Americans, most think it sounds like a pretty good idea. And yet here we are, with Donald Trump in the White House, Republicans in control of both houses of Congress, and Neil Gorsuch on the Supreme Court. And of course, since I wrote those words, that's gotten worse. The Italian philosopher Antonio Gramsci warned that while the old order is dying and the new cannot be born, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. The headlines and Trump's Twitter account provide new examples on a daily basis. Yet there are also many signs of rebirth. For all Trump's noisy promises of action on gun control and immigration reform and health care, his tax bill's blank check to the party's big donors may be the Republicans' sole legislative achievement. But his administration's rollback of federal regulations protecting consumers, the environment, and American workers is likely to be equally damaging, while his quiet reshaping of the federal judiciary in favor of economic privilege and social reaction may last for decades to come. With Trump and Mike Pence in the White House and a conservative majority on the court, decisions that once seemed like settled law, gay marriage, legal abortion, the right to join a union, indeed the very right to citizenship itself for all born inside this country, may now come under attack. These are all fights that we cannot afford to lose. And so, despite the temptation to mourn, we have to organize. Because if we can't rely on the president or the Congress or the courts, we have no choice but to rely on one another. Not just for comfort, but for survival and resistance. There are some in immediate peril who need our help, our energy, and our solidarity. There are others, many, many others, who are already fighting, but who may not see how their battle fits into a bigger picture. Ever since election day, I've tried to adopt no more wishful thinking as my own political mantra. All the same, 
In my reporting on where the energy and purpose and genuinely radical ambition revealed by the Sanders campaign might be going, I found ample grounds, not just for hope, but for optimism. The United States may be a continental power and a global empire, but it is not an island isolated from the currents of world politics. You don't have to be a historical determinist or an orthodox Marxist, I am neither, to see a surge of majoritarian revolt spreading across the globe from the pink tide in Latin America to the democratic ferment that sparked the Arab Spring to the rise of Syriza in Greece and Podemos in Spain. Not all of these challenges to power will succeed. So in trying to map out how we in the US might, as they say in New England, get there from here, I've been guided by two principles. The first is to stay close to the grassroots. The other principle is that history is essential. Not just the first draft of history provided by journalism, but the awareness of possibility, indeed precedent, that only history can provide. I wanted to break through the imposed collective amnesia that lets Americans forget what we have accomplished together in the past. The audacity that let a colony defy the, mo defy the most powerful nation on earth. The courage and solidarity that defeated racial slavery. The democratic confidence that took on fascism in Europe and began the work of building economic security at home. Each of these earlier achievements, these lost republics, was only partially successful. So if we are to complete the work, or even just to advance it, we need to remind ourselves both of what we once accomplished and of the reasons why previous efforts fell short. It was Tom Paine's common sense that first gave the word republic its currency as an American virtue. So in using republic to mean a time when Americans felt not only that their government was legitimately elected, but that it genuinely belonged to them, I'm not so much adding my own gloss as selecting among the many uses because I see little need or prospect of improving upon Abraham Lincoln, who was a small as well as a capital R Republican, when he spoke simply of government of the people, by the people, for the people. Like socialism, that still sounds like a good idea to me. But in my book, discerning readers will detect sympathy for another ideal, almost equally discredited nowadays, namely populism by which I mean both the historical American movements that comprised the 19th century populist revolt and a contemporary sympathy for movements that are frankly majoritarian, trusting in democracy rather than in the discovery of correct doctrine. Though I was often frightened and appalled by the things I saw and heard at Trump rallies, Hillary Clinton's description of his voters as a basket of deplorables and her media cheerleader's eagerness to double down on that contempt still strikes me as both personally despicable and politically dangerous. Whatever else it is, populism has always represented a political and cultural revolt of the people against the elites. And in that fight, I know which side I'm on. There is a ser serious strategic point to be made here as well. While the right might prefer aristocracy or a plutocracy in which the business of America really is business, we on the left can't just dismiss the people no matter how much they may disappoint us. Petulance is not politics. There is simply no alternative, no shortcut. As Jane McAlevey, who's the subject of the first chapter of this book, says, to the hard work of assembling a majority coalition. To attempt anything else, says McAlevey, would be to surrender the most important and only weapon that ordinary people have ever had, which is large numbers. In this book, you'll meet the components of that majority coalition, starting with McAlevey herself and the work she's been doing in winning strikes and organizing unions under the most difficult conditions. Labor, of course, is an essential part of any radical majority. But then so are the rural organizing and environmental, environmental politics represented by Jane Klebb in Nebraska, the big city movement politics and immigrant organizing at the center of Carlos Ramirez Rosa's work in Chicago, the fight over the future of the Democratic Party being waged by Walid Shahid and Corbin Trent and Jane Klebb. The struggle for economic independence and radical racial justice behind Chukwe Antar Lumumba's administration 
in Jackson, Mississippi, and the critique of corporate power and the danger it represents to our democracy, articulated so powerfully by Zephyr Teachout. But as the historical chapters in the book remind us, excluding or ignoring any one of these fights has been a recipe for failure in the past. To take just one example, Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal coalition collapsed in part because of its reliance on Southern Democrats committed to maintaining white supremacy. We are now at a crossroads. Though nearly three million more Americans voted for Hillary Clinton than for Donald Trump, many of us did so despite believing that American politics was broken and with no real enthusiasm for the four more years her campaign seemed to offer. Being against Donald Trump wasn't enough to win the election, and though it happily was sufficient motivation to drive millions of women and their male allies onto the streets to protest his inauguration, mere opposition won't bring us to the next republic either. As Jim Hightower, the 10-gallon-hatted godfather of Texas populism, told me, it's not enough to be for the farmer. You gotta be against those bastards who are trying to run over the farmer. But as Naomi Klein points out, no is not enough. We also need to lay out our yes, because it is the sum of those yeses, marching together, working together, striking together, and voting together, that will bring us together to the next republic. So that's the introduction. And um, there are really two different kinds of chapter in the book. And I'm going to give you a little flavor of, of each. Uh, and then we can talk, because uh, I suppose because it's more interesting for me to have a conversation than just to stand up here and talk at you. And I'd love to hear your views. And I also want to ask you all things about Seattle. Um, but because this is my first time in Seattle. Uh, sadly, I don't think the nation's budget would normally have stretched to sending me here. So I'm, I'm very glad to be here. Um, so there are these chapters that are profiles of activists. And they're hopefully activists that most of you won't have heard of, or at least won't know very much about. You might have heard their names. And if you're a regular nation reader, and if you are, God bless you, um, then you will have perhaps recognized their names. But this is to give you a deeper, a deeper sense of who they are and where they come from and the kind of work they're doing. And how, and this is, again, the overarching argument of the book, how it fits into a new radical majority. Because you know one of the things we, we learned from the 2016 campaign is that um, ideas or aspirations that for decades we'd been told were not just unrealistic, but un-American. Un you know, things like having national health care where you don't go broke if you get sick, or having paid family leave, or having free higher education. That if you give people the chance to say whether they favor those ideas, a majority of pe people favor all of those ideas. So then you have to ask yourself, well, why don't we have any of those things? You know, they have them in Europe. Why don't we have them here? Are we dumber than Europeans? And you know, I, I, I live in Europe, so I can tell you we are not dumber than Europeans. But we do, have, we do have a politics of our own that enables us to be divided instead of standing together for the things that we want and the things that we believe in. And so part of the book is to give you a sense of each segment of that majority coalition, and part of it is to give you a sense of our history and why it is that we, we have this majority, potential majority, or these lost republics, which is what I call them, have splintered in the past. So I'm going to begin by reading. What am I going to begin by reading? I'm going to begin by reading uh, just a little bit of, of, about Jane McAlevey, who's a labor organizer who's part of the time in California and part of the time on the East Coast. And who I met, I first met when I was going to Nevada to report on the Nevada primary. I'd been reading Jane's work for years and really admired it. But I knew that she had done um, some incredible organizing of healthcare unions in Nevada. And that interested me because, as you may or may not know, Nevada is a right to work state. So it's supposed to be, you know, the point of being a right to work state is to make it difficult to organize unions. And yet she was able to go there and successfully organize unions. And when I went to report in Nevada, I discovered something else about Nevada, which is that the hospital unions are not the only really powerful unions in Nevada. That if you go to Las Vegas and you go to any hotel or any casino, the people who clean your room, the people who serve your food, 
the people who check you in, and the people who handle your money when you're losing it are all members of a very powerful union. And all of those people, as a result, have decent salaries, the chance to send their kids to college, good health care coverage, and good pensions. And many of them are, are immigrants without higher education, and yet they, because they have a strong union, they're able to live a middle-class life in a, in a right-to-work state. So, so that's what I wanted to talk to Jane about. And the chapter is called Jane McAlevey, Winning Under Conditions of Extreme Adversity, because I think we can all agree that right now we are in a time of extreme adversity. My notes from that evening don't say whether labor organizer and author Jane McAlevey actually used the phrase, not so fast. But the whole tenor of her argument was one of skepticism and caution, as she pulled apart what she called the myth of demography as destiny. It is July 2016, the week of the Democratic Convention. Excuse me. And we are sitting in a Mexican restaurant in Center City, Philadelphia, eating nopales and arguing. Buoyed by the ecstatic reception given to Bernie Sanders' primetime speech earlier in the week, and no doubt by the margaritas we'd ordered, I'm waxing optimistic about Hillary Clinton's upcoming victory in November. With the Democratic Party platform essentially drafted by the Sanders campaign, and with Clinton herself now able to turn her formidable organization toward an all-out fight with Donald Trump, and given the Democrats' widening demographic advantage among the rising American electorate of women, millennials, and people of color, surely progressives can stop worrying about the election and start focusing on how best to push the next Clinton administration to the left. She hasn't sealed the deal, says McAlevey. Sure, Clinton had finally come out against the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a huge issue for labor, and therefore, therefore a big deal for McAlevey, a veteran union organizer. Though Clinton had been endorsed by labor leaders, not just the national AFL-CIO, but everyone from steelworkers and teamsters to the American Federation of Teachers, McAlevey wasn't convinced rank-and-file union members really bought her change of heart. And when it came to the suburban women, the Democrats were clearly targeting during the convention, and who were supposed to be sufficiently repelled by both the tone and the substance of the Republican campaign to make their overwhelming support for Clinton in November merely a matter of getting out the vote, McAlevey was emphatic. I've been in the state for months working for PASNAP, the Pennsylvania Association of Staff Nurses and Allied Professionals, an independent union representing hospital workers, which means that I spend a lot of my time listening to women and talking politics, and she hasn't sealed the deal with suburban women. I don't think she's going to win Pennsylvania. For a reporter on the campaign trail, those last few months of the 2016 election were like watching a train wreck. Even though it all seemed to be happening in slow motion, there was nothing I could do about it. But unlike a lot of, a lot of other horrified bystanders, I couldn't say I hadn't been warned. Spend any time with McAlevey and you will hear a lot about winning. Those of us who still win hard strikes, explaining why Democrats were wrong to take the Rust Belt for granted. In Wisconsin, we couldn't win over the union households we needed to get rid of the worst anti-union governor in modern times. In Michigan, the unions put a measure on the ballot to enshrine collective bargaining in the Michigan Constitution. In the heartland of the United Auto Workers, we couldn't win over most union households to vote for collective bargaining. Or why she thinks Ralph Nader-style consumer advocacy, however well-intentioned, is a futile tactic. Because it can't win any serious fights. It can only win small gains. McAlevey has been in one serious fight after another for the past three decades. Her first arrest at age 19 came during a campaign, ultimately successful, to force the State University of New York to divest its financial interests in South Africa. A few dozen arrests later, she's led strikes by janitors in Stamford, Connecticut, built houses and schools in Nicaragua, fought for environmental justice in Central America, run a project on the dangers of toxic pollution in poor rural communities in the, United, in the United States, organized thousands of hospital workers in Nevada, and been pushed out of the Service Employees International Union over her candid criticism of union leaders' cozy relationship with corporate bosses. Raising expectations and raising hell, her unsparing account of her success in winning strikes and securing contracts, and her defeat by the union hierarchy, has become an underground Bible for a new generation of labor activists. 
When we met in Philadelphia, she was in the middle of a campaign to organize nurses at seven area hospitals and had just won a series of crucial votes, adding thousands of members at a time when labor unions were supposed to be in terminal decline. Well, if you want to know how she did it, you'll have to read the book. <laughs> and now I'm going to give you a little taste of a uh, historical chapter. And it, this is called, so there, there are three um, lost republics that I write about in this book. The first one is the Whiskey Republic. And that's about the Whiskey Rebellion, which took place in western Pennsylvania. And what interests me about the Whiskey Rebellion and the reason I decided to devote a whole chapter to it is because I was in western Pennsylvania uh, before the Pennsylvania primary, following around a man came, named John Fetterman, who was then running for the Democratic nomination for Senate. And I, I was with him on probably the worst day of his campaign, because in 2008, when Barack Obama was running for president for the first time, he had said, in a speech in San Francisco, actually, that um, people were desperate. And because they were desperate, they, they clung to their guns and their religion. And he was basically pilloried for that comment in the press. Uh, and John Fetterman was, at the time, the mayor of Braddock, Pennsylvania, and was one of the very few elected officials in the country who defended Obama. Now, the thing is, if you've ever met John, you won't forget him, because he's six foot eight with a shaved head, and as he said, a build more like a professional wrestler than a professional politician. And that's without the fact that he's got tattoos up and down both arms. On one arm, he has the zip code of Braddock, Pennsylvania, where he's the mayor, and in the other arm, He's got the dates of everyone who's been killed by gun violence since he's been the mayor of Braddock, he's, uh, the dates of their deaths. So um, he's a pretty colorful figure. And when he stuck his neck out for Obama, it mattered, because he had, he had credibility with working class voters. Um, and the day I was with him, he was taking me for a, a, a driving tour up the Mon Valley, up the Monongahela River, in what used to be the center of American steel making, and is now basically one bomb site town after another. Uh, and while we were driving, he got a call on his cell phone from his campaign uh, manager who told him that oh, that day Obama was endorsing his opponent in the, in the Pennsylvania primary for Senate, a woman called Katie McGinty, who was a state official who had extensive ties to the fracking industry. And at the end of the day, I went back to John's house, and he was pretty low. And he said to me, you know, she, Katie McGinty is never going to win in Pennsylvania. And he said, and Hillary Clinton isn't going to carry Western Pennsylvania either. She's probably not going to win this state. And I, I assumed that, unlike Jane, who had said the same thing, I assumed that, but she said it much later, I assumed at the time that John was just talking sour grapes, you know, that he was upset because, and pissed off because Obama had, had endorsed his opponent. But he gave me numbers of what he thought was going to happen in these three counties in western Pennsylvania. And his numbers were within hundreds of being right. Because these three counties gave, well, just two counties, actually. Washington County and I've forgotten the name of the other one. Uh, Trump won Pennsylvania by 68,000 votes. And in just these two counties in western Pennsylvania, his margin was 80,000 votes. And, uh, and I said to John, well, what is it about Western Pennsylvania? And he said, well, you know, this is where the Whiskey Rebellion was. And ever since that got suppressed, people have been pissed off at Washington. <laughs> uh, and I said, so tell me about it. And so he, he told me a little bit about it, and I went and read up on it. So the Whiskey Rebellion was essentially a rebellion of people, farmers, who were pushing back against Alexander Hamilton's plans to make the federal government take a, a side and shape the colonial economy in the interests of wealthy manufacturers. I mean, I, there's more about it in the book, and I'm not going to go into it all here. But what was interesting was that it, the center of it was exactly those counties that had gone for Obama in 2008 and in 2012 and went for Trump in 2014, in 2016. Um, anyway, the second republic that I write about is called the, the, the Lincoln Republic. And I'll tell you a little bit about that and why I, why I write about it. The chapter's called, When the Republicans Were Woke, 
the death and life of the, Rinkley, the, Wink, the Lincoln Republic. Let's see. Okay. If, as William Faulkner insisted, the high watermark of the Confederacy can be found partway up the slope of Cemetery Ridge, a low rise a few miles south of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, just before 2 o'clock on the afternoon of July 3rd, 1863, a moment when, speaking for every Southern boy 14 years old, Faulkner wrote, it's all in the balance, it hasn't happened yet, meaning that some 15,000 charging Confederates, led by Major General George Pickett, had not yet been flanked and cut to pieces by, among others, two regiments of the 2nd Vermont Brigade, ending Robert E. Lee's invasion of the North. The fullest flourishing of the Lincoln Republic is harder to specify. Lincoln himself remains a complex, largely unknowable figure whose brooding dominance over our history still manages to leave room in the popular imagination for everything from the fanciful adventures of Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter, that is an actual book, to controversy over whether the 16th president had, as his biographer Carl Sandburg and many others since have claimed, a streak of lavender. Instead, we have Lincoln's rhetoric, itself encompassing not only the patient exposition of the Peoria speech and the Cooper Union address, which helped him win the Republican nomination, and the peerless concision of the Gettysburg Address, but also the prophetic reckoning and prom promised reconciliation of the second inaugural. The Lincoln Republic is another thing, though named for the man who both enunciated its highest ideals and whose calculating response to the exigencies of warfare brought it into being. The Lincoln Republic owed no more and no less to Lincoln himself than a child owes to a parent who dies before its birth. The struggles for workers' rights, racial justice, and economic equity in America existed before Abraham Lincoln and carry on today. But the fusing together of those battles into a great national mobilization, enlisting not only millions of Americans, but the vast power of the federal government, though largely forgotten today, is as much Lincoln's legacy as any speech or statue. As we find ourselves yet again in a time when the arrogance of wealth seems restrained neither by law nor custom, it may be useful to recall how our ancestors confronted and overcame the dominant oligarchy of their day, and how at the very moment of victory, they were cheated of their prize. So I'll just say a little bit more about the Lincoln Republic, and then we'll move on to something else. And if you want to know more about it, again, there's more here. It was the war, more than the man himself, that gave birth to the Lincoln Republic. At least since his speech in Peoria in 1854, Lincoln had been clear in his view that civic equality was the sheet anchor of American republicanism. Slavery, he'd said then, was not just wrong, it was monstrous, because it deprives our republican example of its just influence in the world, enables the enemies of free institutions with plausibility to taunt us as hypocrites. Yet as he admitted, Lincoln saw no way to end actually existing slavery by legislative fiat, a view he repeated in his first inaugural. It was the slaves themselves that forced the issue, fleeing plantations in their thousands for union lines, and gradually making the administration realize that they, their bodies, their labor, their eagerness to fight for freedom, were the hinge on which the fortunes of war would swing. In that sense, at least, the Emancipation Proclamation was the Lincoln Republic's founding document, not just for what it did, which in practical terms wasn't all that much, since the writ of the federal government on January 1st, 1863, didn't actually run to the states in rebellion, but for what it promised. When the war was over, the Confederacy's slaves would be forever free. As he'd intended, Lincoln's proclamation put paid to the British Prime Minister Gladstone's campaign to have his country recognize the Confederacy. It also meant that abolition in America would follow a very different course than it had in Britain's colonies. When the British abolished slavery in 1833, the government had paid slave owners 20 million pounds in compensation, an enormous sum, amounting to 40% of the Treasury's annual budget. Gladstone's own father, John, received 106,000 pounds for the 2,508 slaves he owned 
across nine plantations, the equivalent of about $80 million today. Before the war, even most American abolitionists balked at the, course, at the cost of buying out slavery. With Lincoln's promise and its fulfillment in the 13th Amendment three years later, the government, the federal government, had simply expropriated and liquidated assets worth nearly, nearly 50 times the entire $78 million federal budget for 1860. To give you an idea of the scale of, of the radicalism of that single measure, imposing a total ban today on the use of fossil fuels would be a smaller step economically. Other wartime economic measures were almost as significant and as radical. In order to finance the war, the government issued over a billion dollars worth of bonds, many of them sold to investors overseas, and imposed the country's first federal income tax, a flat 3% on incomes over $800 a year, and a property tax. Since only the top 3% of the population earned enough to have to pay it, the income tax was widely popular, but also ineffective. In 1862, the measure was raised to make the tax progressive, with a 3% rate on incomes above $600, and a 5% rate on incomes over $10,000 and on the, the income of Americans who lived ab abroad. The Legal Tender Act of 1862 allowed the government to issue fiat currency, paper money not convertible to gold or silver, printing hundreds of millions of dollars in greenbacks to pay for goods and services. At the same time, the absence of Southern Democratic legislators let the Republican Congress act both on infrastructure projects long favored by former Whigs and the homesteading agenda of the former Free Soil Democrats. The moral tariff not only raised revenue to fight the war, but also shielded American industry from, from European competition. The Homestead Act and the Land Grant College Act provided free land, public education, and the agricultural development of the West. So, uh, that's the beginnings of the Lincoln Republic. And then I, I write about why it stopped dead in its tracks. And again, you can get deeper into that, but not right now. <laughs> uh, and then finally, I'm going to read a little bit from a chapter about two young men who I met in the course of the, in fact, I met both of these, both, I met one of these young men reporting on the election and one of them after the election. Uh, I met Walid Shahid. Well, I, I think I read about why I met. I'll read about why I met Walid Shahid. Did I? Will I? Maybe I won't. I met Walid Shahid um, opening the Sanders office in Philadelphia. He was, uh, and still is, a young man, the son of a parking lot attendant. And he stood up and he said, I'll tell you why we need a political, I'll tell you who needs a political revolution in this country. My father needs a political revolution. And he talked about how his father had come to America from Pakistan and had worked for 30 years as a, for the same company as a parking lot attendant, and was still a parking lot attendant, and had saved and worked hard and put three kids through school and uh, had put all his savings, because that's what everybody told him to do, into a house, which he lost in the 2008 crash. He lost, they lost everything. And he, uh, he said, and now that my father is getting older, the, co the company that he works for is cutting back on his hours because, you know, they want younger workers so they don't have to pay as much. So that was his story about why we needed a political revolution. And I thought, this is somebody who's worth paying attention to. Uh, Corbin Trent, the other young man, I met in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And he was starting then something called a brand new Congress, and the, the, the idea was that with Hillary Clinton's election assumed, um, what was going to be needed was a Congress that would be able to push her to the left, and that that was never going to happen in a Congress dominated by corporate Democrats. So it was how do we change Congress and how do we do it all at once? And their, their theory was that we were in a post-partisan moment, and that therefore you could recruit a whole bunch of people in both parties who would have a commitment to things like uh, health care for everybody and, uh, and you know, basic civil rights for everybody. And you could recruit Republicans as well as Democrats to run on this 
combined platform and then change Congress and get things done. And it seemed a little far-fetched at the time, and it turned out to be completely a complete misreading of history. Um, but the interesting thing about Corbyn is that in that process, he was going around the country giving speeches because he'd been he'd been a, somebody who, who invented something called the Bernie Barnstorm, where they'd come to your town for three days, and they'd take all the people who were independently doing work for, for Bernie Sanders' campaign, and they'd teach them how to use phone banks, how to do canvassing, how to use the database, how to set up call centers. And then they'd leave and they'd say, right, now, now you know how to do it, you get on with it. So it was, it was a decentralized or organization. It wasn't a centrally run campaign. And it, it won lots of states for Bernie Sanders. So I thought, well, okay, this guy is wrong about this moment, but he's been right about other things he's worth paying attention to. And in fact, the first candidate he recruited for what began as brand new Congress and then became a successor group once they realized that we were not in a post-partisan moment called Justice Democrats, uh, was a woman who you may have heard of because she's been in the news lately called Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, who was, who, who won a primary in, in Queens a couple of months ago, knocking off Joe, Joe Crowley, a 10-term incumbent, who was you know, widely considered to be a potential Speaker of the House. Um, so this chapter is called A Tea Party of the Left, question mark. June 10th, 2014 was a hot, sunny day in Washington. Down in Richmond, the biggest city in Virginia's 7th Congressional District. It was even hotter, and not just in degrees. That was the day the Tea Party, an upstart group born out of the ashes of Ron Paul's failed 2008 presidential campaign, and previously known mainly for their costume protests against President Obama's stimulus package, the Wall Street bailout, immigration reform, and the Affordable Care Act, managed to defeat Eric Cantor, the sitting Re Republican majority leader in the House of Representatives. Cantor was no liberal. A favorite of corporate PACs and K Street lobbyists, he'd raised over, 50, over $30 million for the Republican National C Congressional Committee. His own campaign boasted a $5.5 million budget and 23 paid staffers. Excuse me. Plus support from the National Rifle Association and the National Right to Life Committee and hefty donations from the Blackstone Group and Goldman Sachs. His opponent was Dave Bratt, an economics professor at Randolph-Macon College and Tea Party activist. Bratt ran without any assistance from the party's national organization. He never got a single PAC donation either. Instead, he raised just $200,000 from local donors and didn't even spend all of it. Bratt's campaign manager, Zachary Werrell, was a 23-year-old Haverford graduate who slept on his boss's couch to, to save money. An internal poll on the Friday before the primary showed Cantor lead, leading by 34 points. A Daily Caller poll put him ahead by 13 points. Yet when the votes were counted, it was the seven-term incumbent Cantor who came up short, the first majority leader ever to be defeated by a primary challenger. Bratt's upset victory sent a current of fear through the Republican caucus in both houses of Congress, stiffening the party's leaders in their policy of non-cooperation with the Obama administration and killing off a bipartisan effort on immigration reform. Those at least were the headlines. But there was another response to Bratt's unheralded triumph among activists and organizations on the left, envy. For years, in some cases decades, these groups had been stymied by a Democratic Party that seemed increasingly contemptuous of its base. Whether it was labor opposition to the North American Free Trade Agreement and the Trans-Pacific Partnership, African-American and Hispanic objections to mass incarceration, or the growing influence of Wall Street bankers over what had once been seen as the party of working Americans, these activists had waged a long, Sisyphean struggle against the party leadership. Now a ragtag bunch of Republicans put the fear of the grassroots into their party. Could the left, both inside and outside the Democratic Party, emulate their achievement? What might, what might a Tea Party of the left come from? What would it look like? And what would it be its signature issues? So on those questions, I'm going to stop because I think we should, we should talk and, and ask other questions. But um, 
thank you very much for coming. And um, what's on your mind? And maybe I can begin by, a by asking some, doing a little audience participation. So can you tell me how many people in this room are registered to vote? Good. Okay. So I don't have to send... I see you're not registered to vote in the back there. You got to register to vote. <laughs> Okay, you all heard it, so you're, you're her neighbors. You keep an eye on that lady, make sure she registers. Uh, and of the people who voted in 2016, how many of you voted for Bernie Sanders? None of you, one of you, okay. How many of you voted for Hillary Clinton? Wow, and how many of you voted for Donald Trump? Okay, well, I'm glad you're all here, you're all welcome. I like to know what kind of audience we, you know, we're working with here, that's good. Um, and, I also want to say that it is a great pleasure to be in a state like my own, Vermont, where you have a socialist elected official. Um, anyway, questions? And just a reminder, if, um, if you would please come up to the microphone so we can all hear you and pick up the recordings. Um, I thought I might actually jump in with a sort of curator's prerogative question while um, this gentleman is coming up. There's a lot of um, discussion about whether or not if the Democrats take power soon, mm -hmm. there needs to be a radical focus on changing procedural things around elections, so elector, um, voter disenfranchisement, maybe statehood for D.C. and Puerto Rico, splitting California up into multiple states, this kind of Democrats wow. need to play dirty thesis. What do you think about that as the, uh, how, how um, urgent is that as a strategy for, for the Democrats? Well, I guess I, I can't get too excited about any of the specific <laughs> proposals that you mentioned, but um, and I, I'm not really sure that it's Democrats need to pay di play dirty, but I'll tell you something. I was driving um, the day that Kavanaugh was confirmed, and so I was listening to, to National Public Radio, and you had one reporter after another talking about the impact of this confirmation on the Senate and when we might see the return of civility, and I thought, you know, it's way too early for civility. Um, that, I mean, I mean, in general, I'm in favor of civility. I, I believe in, in, you know, being polite to people. But I feel like we are, uh, whether we are Democrats or, or nonpartisan radicals or, or just people who are fed up with a system that is rigged to favor the rich, because um, I, I welcome anybody to whom any of those labels fit. Um, we are fighting with one hand behind our back if, if they are being fundamentally ruthless and we are trying to say, you know, we'll meet you halfway. Because they keep moving the goalposts to the right and we keep meeting them halfway. And in the end, you know, the left goalpost now is where the right goalpost used to be because they kept moving it to the right. So I think we, we have to know what we're for and we have to know who we're against. I had an argument, I was in um, Lincoln, Nebraska two nights ago, and we were talking with um, Jane Klebb, who's one of the people who's a, a chapter in this book, and she's now the chair of the Nebraska Democratic Party, but at the, in 2016, she was um, mostly spending her time trying to stop the Keystone Pipeline, and then also became a, a supporter of our revolution, so. Uh, and I said to her, and this was a, we hadn't rehearsed this beforehand. This was an open, I was genuinely curious. I said, what is the point of, of Joe Manchin? Tell me what the point of somebody who, you know, if we're supposed to support, if the Democratic Party is supposed to be a broad church and we're supposed to welcome everybody who professes to be a Democrat, and then when it comes to the things where it really matters, um, the person decides that they don't have to vote with the party, then what is the point of supporting people like that? And, you know, she is the chair of the state party, so she had to give a, uh, an argument about a broad church, which I, I assume she was sincere in, but I think most of the people in the room couldn't see the point of, of Democrats like that. And I guess, so it's not exactly an answer to your question, but I suppose I, th I think we need, to be, we need to be clear about what we're for and we need to be clear about who we're against. Yes, sir. Ronald Reagan was a proponent of trickle-down economics. Yes. 
And some years later, the University of Washington here did a study of the results of that policy, and they stated in their alumni magazine that the only thing that trickled down were the people. <laughs> uh, Reagan also promoted union busting and uh, the reduction in regulations. My question is, how important a figure was Ronald Reagan in the downfall of the middle class? That's a really good question. Um, and I will, I mean, I hate to put it this way, but in a sense, that's what, the, that's what the fall of the Roosevelt Republic chapter is about. It's not all about Reagan, but it is about the fall of the middle class and, and, what, and what it fell from. Because uh, if you cover a, a presidential election in America, you end up spending a lot of time in the state of Ohio. So I spent a lot of time in the state of Ohio. And as I was traveling in Ohio, I kept on coming across these well, I thought of them as kind of relics of a, of a lost civilization, kind of like the, the Statue of Liberty on the beach at the end of Planet of the Apes, you know, this fragment, and you think, what is that? Who built this thing? And what I mean by these fragments of a lost civilization are things like the Rubber Bowl in Akron, or the Bow Federal Building, uh, or in, in Canton, or the murals in the Cleveland Public Library that show this incredible building of the bridge across the Ohio River. And as I would come across these, these sort of fragments of lost grandeur, I, I, I just, they began to haunt me. And I thought, well, what is this? What, you know, where are these things from? And finally, I came across a building, I forget which town it's in, although I do say so in the book, where I saw a cornerstone. And the cornerstone said, Project 1152, PWA, 1936. And I realized that the lost civilization whose relics I kept seeing was the, was the New Deal. And that there had been a time in American history when the federal government knew that it was its job to make sure that everybody had a job who was capable of working and who wanted a job. It was its job to make sure that people didn't go, didn't starve in their old age, that people weren't bankrupted by you know, by illness, that, that farmers were able to earn a living if they, if they farmed their land. And the interesting thing is that if you look at the, at the statistics on income distribution, there's this thing that economists call the Great Compression. And if you look at income distribution now, you know, you have a few billionaires at the top who have, you know, 50% of the wealth, and then you have a few more millionaires and you get to 99% of the wealth and then you have this vast everybody else who has 1% of the wealth. But in, from 1939 to 1975 or 80, the income distribution in the US looked like a, a compressed diamond. In other words, it, was, it bulged in the middle and it was small at the top and the bottom. And the reason for that is because of the taxes that Franklin Roosevelt instituted to pay for the Second World War and then left in place. And the reason I'm, I'm mentioning this to answer your question is because those, it was those taxes and things like the GI Bill that sent a generation of, of Americans, including my father and my uncle, neither of whom would have been able to afford to go to college, to college because they'd served in the, you know, in the, in the armed forces, that created the American middle class that created an Ameri America where if you worked hard, you could be sure that your children would have a better life than you, that they would be able to go to college, and that you would be able to retire with decency and dignity. And the first president to roll back those tax rates was John Kennedy in 1960. And it was the Kennedy tax cut that began the unspooling of this Great Compression and it was the Kennedy tax cut that served as the inspiration that Ronald Reagan uh, cited when he made even deeper tax cuts and when he started, I mean, Kennedy was just cutting taxes. Reagan was trying to dismantle the, co the common sphere. He was trying to shrink the common sphere to dismantle the federal government. So Reagan's an important figure, but I think it's a mistake to, to say that he is the only person to blame this on because uh, Kennedy did it 
because Jimmy Carter did different things that also shrunk the, shrunk the sphere of the state and shrunk the ability of the federal government to help people. And then Reagan, and then Reagan took it further. And of course, now we're getting to the point where you know, the federal government doesn't just not help you, you know, it keeps its foot on your neck. Uh, that's what Trump is trying to do. You know, he's trying to make it possible for corporations to make it difficult, to, you know, where we can't drink the water, we can't breathe the air, and where if we protest too much, we'll get locked up. So I feel like um, it's a really important question. But the, the reason that the chapter is in the book is to say that we did this once before. You know, we had these things once. If you go to Western Pennsylvania, if you go to Youngstown, if you go to Canton, if you go to... Um, if you go to uh, war in Ohio and you talk to, to, to working people, you get this impression that people feel like something has been taken from them. And sure, some of what people feel has been taken from them has been maybe white privilege or male privilege, but something else has been taken from them too because a lot of the people who feel that something has been taken from them voted twice for a Barack Obama. You know, they vote for Marcy Kaptur, but they didn't vote for Hillary Clinton because they felt that something had been taken for them, from them and that she had no interest in giving it back. And I feel like it's very important to remember that we once had a government that people felt was on their side and that was capable of not just being on their side, but of doing great things. I mean, I, where I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, the zoo and all of the parks were built by the WPA. You know, you can go across this country and you can see bridges and canals and all sorts of things, airports that were built by the WPA, built by the federal government, which left not only this wonderful infrastructure, which is now rotting and rusting, but also gave people jobs. So I, I, you know, it's, I guess the point of the historical chapters is we did it once, and if we did it once, we can do it again. Hello. Um, how do we get, what, what is the course towards getting some of our democratic senior states people to step aside and allow the field to be open to younger folks? I hear words bandied around like Joe Biden, Elizabeth Warren, John Kerry, and I just kind of feel like these are people whose time has come and, and gone, and it's time to be nurturing new young leadership. So what is the process by which we do that? Well, I agree with you, um, and you know, and it, and you left out Bernie Sanders, who's after all older than all of those people. Um, but I agree with you, except except for one thing, except that, and maybe it's because I'm getting on myself. I don't think it's just about age. I mean, I don't think that there's anything intrinsically wrong with somebody having experience and staying in politics. I think that's valuable. But I also think that uh, that too often politicians who've become incumbents come to feel that their positions belong to them rather than to the people who elected them. And I suppose the way to deal with that is to remind them that that's not true. And there are lots of ways of doing that. You know, the best way of doing that is to encourage younger people to vote and to run for office. And to, and generally, encourage, and it, for me, it's not, it's not mostly about age, I confess. I mean, I would like to see more younger people run for office, but it's about having more teachers running for office, more nurses running for office, you know, more union members running for office, um, more civil servants running for office, and fewer, fewer lawyers and hedge fund managers running for office. I would like to see that. Um, but there's a, there's a pitfall there. In the book, I quote a, a, a man I've known a long time and admire very much called Daniel Cantor, who's the founder of the Working Families Party in New York. And he's been trying to, using the mechanism of having this extra line on the ballot, which New York State lets you do, so you can run, you can vote for somebody without having to vote for them as a Democrat. You can vote for them as a member of the Working Families Party. He's been trying to slowly shove the Democratic, well, he's been trying to shove it to the left. Not so slowly, but it's been slow. And what he said to me is that if you, because we were talking about this question of a Tea Party of the left, and, you know, and, and whether you could whether you could occupy the Democratic Party, which is what some people used to say during the days of Occupy Wall Street. And he said, if you try to occupy the Democratic Party and that's all you're focused on, in the end, the Democratic Party ends up occupying you. So, you know, you, you, 
I guess the, the, the lesson for me from that is you have to fight on more than one front. So of course you have to vote, you have to become active in your local party, you have to pay attention to how candidates get chosen and make sure that you know, your voice is heard in those councils and also that younger people are in, and people from different, more varying backgrounds, people who look like the communities they, they want to represent are in those councils. But on the same, at the same time, if that's all you're doing, partly because that's such an uphill fight, and partly because the people in power already have power. I mean the Democrats in power. So you need, to, you need to also find ways to keep your own political capital, you know, whether it's by being active in your union at work or your PTA or your church group, you know, or, or the, the little league that you coach or the, or the soccer team or whatever. We all have lives that are outside of electoral politics but that are nonetheless part of our life as citizens. And I feel like it's cultivating that social capital that means that when you come into a, a candidate selection meeting, you're not just somebody who's shown up and helped to get petitions signed. You're somebody who's you know, produced 300 people to come for a demonstration to get better funding for your local school or to put in a safer crossing or to, you know, or to, or to keep a park. Um, and so it's important to, to not focus all our energies on the Democratic Party, I would say. That's since you asked. I mean, it's just my view, but. Other questions? Well, I had one more I wanted to ask before sure. we let you go, which is I was very excited in um, the book to see that there was a chapter profi profiling uh, Chokwe Antar Lumumba, who's a mm -hmm. figure I'm really interested in and find inspiring, uh, mayor of Jackson, Mississippi. Um, and there's like there is an outside chance of maybe a Democrat winning this My Senate guess, race yeah, in in Mississippi. Okay. There's obviously Tennessee is one of you know in the universe where Democrats maybe unlikely but possibly retake the Senate in uh, in a month. It involves probably at least Tennessee. What are your thoughts about the the kind of 50 state strategy, red state organizing in Mississippi and Tennessee? Sure. And, and, and since your book is about populism, do you think that there is a populist movement possible in the Deep South and other red states? Places? I, I'm certain that there's yeah. a populist movement possible in the Deep South, and that's part of what the, cha the chapters in the book that deal with that are about. The trick is that populist movements in the Deep South have always been possible because the Deep South is one of the least, it's one of the most underdeveloped parts of the country. Um, so there's plenty of popular anger at the way people have been treated the thing is that it's always been possible to channel that anger into, into um, racist resentment. And that's what splintered the, the original populists in the 1890s, and it was, it's what splintered, in the end, it's what splintered, and there's, this is the part of the chapter about the Roosevelt Republic, is that the CIO started this organizing campaign, Operation Dixie, right after, right after World War II, um, to try and organize people in the cotton mills in, in Carolinas, and, and all other, lots of other union organizing drives in the South. And they were attacked by the AFL partly because the CIO unions were integrated and had black leaders. So, you know, the, the reason that the Mississippi chapter is in the book is because racism is the sort of original sin of America and it's the thing that, it's not just th something we're supposed to feel guilty about. Um, it's just that it's the thing that that keeps, that our, politi our progressive politics keep shattering on it. It's the thing that keeps splitting our coalitions. And so, you know, I write, I write partly out of an impulse as somebody who is my age and looks like me, so a middle-aged white guy, um, and who has heard lots of other middle-aged white guys say over the years that if women would just stop talking about women's issues and, and black people would stop talking about identity politics and gay people would just be quiet, um, that we could have a, a progressive movement that was all about class, and that, that's, what, that's what you really need to do, and, and it's all this identity politics that's holding back this potential. And I, I feel very deeply, I'm totally convinced that that is bullshit. Um, so I wanted to show how essential those elements were, and what, one of the things that fascinates me about, so, his name is Chukwe Antar Lumumba. He's the mayor of Jackson, Mississippi, and he, 
he stood up and he said he wants to make Jackson the most radical city in the country, which is, <laughs> given where he's starting from, he's got a long way to go. But um, his father was also called Chukwe Lumumba, so people who, who know him call him Antar by his middle name, so you can tell which Lumumba you're talking about. Anyway, um, his father was a black nationalist and something of a separatist uh, who slowly came to the point where he was a believer in running for political office and became mayor of Jackson and then died, sadly, four months after he was elected. But, um, and his son did not inherit the office. He, he ran for his father's office and lost and then had to run again four years later and win. Um, but it's, it, it, I guess for me, Mississippi, because I grew up in Tennessee, so, and we were always grateful in Tennessee that there was Mississippi, because anytime you'd look at a table of, you know, educational achievement or health or like, you know, inoculation rates, pretty much anything. As low as Tennessee would be, you could, you could rely on the fact that Mississippi would be somewhere below us, you know, keeping us from being the bottom. So in terms of racism, Mississippi is the worst place. It's the hardest place. Uh, and, you know, we'll know that we have fixed racism in America when, it, when it's fixed in Mississippi. Uh, and that's what Antar is up against. You know, he is trying to build... Uh, I don't know whether it's fair to call it socialism in one city, but he's trying to build a different economic model for economic development that's inclusive, that doesn't gentrify in a way that forces people out, but that encourages local industry, that, encur that, that provides jobs for people who are already there and doesn't make people leave. Um, but he's doing it in the face of you know, an incredibly racist state government. So having said that, um, you know, there are he got elected with something like 90% of the vote in Jackson. Um, and again, in Tennessee, I mean, Corbin Trent is from East Tennessee. Uh, and he organized East Tennessee for Bernie, and they, Bernie Sanders carried East Tennessee. So there, you know, there are radicals out there. Um, but most of them have gotten used to the idea that there was no point participating in electoral politics because no, they weren't going to win anything and if, they, and if they did, nothing was going to change. So, you know, we have to be able to offer people real change and I think the possibility of real change, I think that's part of what's behind Beto O'Rourke in Texas who I personally think has a probably better shot at winning than, certainly than Espy in Mississippi, um, is that, you know, he, he offers people uh, the prospect not just of a change in policy, but a change in the way people think about politics. And I think that's, that's what's needed to, to get people excited. Sir, please. Um, I mean, I assume you weren't standing there. <laughs> uh, hi. Hi. Um, so kind of going with populism, I was reading a statistic that 71% um, of all climate change and emissions are from 100 companies um, in the world, which was shocking to me. But how do you radicalize the movement? We've talked about like Lincoln and the Whiskey Rebellion, which are all kind of social and kind of economic in a certain mm -hmm. way. But how do you radicalize the movement when time's running out? If there's 12 years, we don't really have 12 years to get ready to start a movement, get ready for action to take back Congress, executive branch, judicial branch. Change needs to happen in a very short time, but time has run out. Well, I guess I would say that if you're a radical, time is always running out. I mean, you know. Uh, if you were somebody in, I don't know, if you were somebody in America in 1856 uh, and you were, you were a supporter of William Seward, who was the Republican candidate, so his supporters were organized into what were called wide awake clubs. That's why the chapter is called when, when Republicans were woke, because they would, they would have these, uh, these rallies where they would chant that they were wide awake. Um, or Fremont was the choice in, in, in 1856. Anyway, if you were somebody like that, and you were motivated because you knew that, say you, were in Ohio, say you were in Cincinnati and you knew that across the river in Kentucky there were people who were in slavery. Well, it didn't feel like you had a lot of time to free them before their lives were you know, forever blighted. So I would say it always feels urgent, but I'm not saying it isn't really urgent. I agree with you it's urgent, but I guess I think I'm sort of more interested in your original point about the 100 companies because I feel like that's what's, what's important is to provide people with the information that they can act on in a way that allows them to feel that they have, you know, that they can actually do something. 
And in a sense, that's why I wrote this book, because you know, by freeing the slaves, Lincoln did something that was much more radical than if, for example, a President Hillary Clinton had said, well, you know, we've really got to keep all this oil in the ground, and the oil companies are going to keep trying to, to take it out, so we're going to nationalize them all tomorrow. I mean, he did something more radical than that. So I guess the th my, my, my point is that with climate change, I mean, there's a chapter about Jane Kleb and stopping the Keystone Pipeline. I think uh, the other part that you might find useful, and the, the other piece of this, and in fact, it's the last chapter of the book, is about Zephyr Teachout and her critique of corporate power. Because, you know, that's what I mean by we have to know what we're against. Um, that yes, the pipeline companies are going to kill us. You know, they're going to, they're, the, the fracking companies are going to destroy the planet. And I was in, I was in um, Youngstown, Ohio, and they were, they had been sold the idea that fracking was going to be their economic salvation. And they had to stop because they had earthquakes. So, you know, I would say there's plenty of stuff to organize around. And, uh, and for me, that's much more urgent than whether we're going to chop up California into three states or, <laughs> you know, procedural things. I mean, I think it's, it's a really important fight. Um, and all I can say is, you know, there's, there's plenty to do and plenty of people to, who are doing it. But I think it's a great question. Thank you. I think that that's a good moment to wrap up on. Didi Gattenplan, thank you so much. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.